happy to welcome you to Disciples Net today. Whether it's snowy and cold or hot and humid, wherever you are, come into our worship and join us. We will sing, we will share communion, we'll hear a wonderful message on this, the first Sunday in Lent, as we prepare to examine ourselves and meditate in preparation for the great festival to follow when we celebrate resurrection. So now, enter into a spirit of thought, of loving, of reflection, and worship as you join us today. Welcome. be reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Will you join me now in prayer? God of wildness and water, 
Your Son was baptized and tempted, as we are. Guide us through this season, that we may not avoid struggle, but open ourselves to blessing through the cleansing depths of repentance and the heaven-sent words of the Spirit. As we look at ourselves, we know that there are things that we have done by accident, harming others and ourselves and your world. Work in this world to restore your creatures and creation from what we have done in ignorance or incomplete information. And yes, there are things that we have done by intent. Knowing that we would bring harm, but wanting the power, the independence, the fleeting pleasure that it would give. Work in our hearts to restore your image within us, that we ourselves would restore what we have wrecked. As you have known our weakness, so may we know your power to save. Work in ourselves, our communities, nations, and world, in our leaders and those who support them, to bring true peace, true well-being, and true recognition of the worth of every person, creature, and living thing. Fill us with your strength to resist the seductions of our foolish desires and the tempter's vain delights, that we may walk in obedience and righteousness, rejoicing in you with an upright heart. In the name of Jesus our Christ, and with the prayer that he taught us, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, The Temptation of Jesus. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. 
He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. God's plan made an excellent beginning. Man ruined his chances by sinning. We trust that the story will end in God's glory. But at present, the other side's winning. The first Sunday of Lent, we talk about sin, we talk about temptation, and we look at two stories of Scripture, one Adam and Eve being tempted and falling to sin in the Garden of Eden, the other Jesus Christ in the wilderness being tempted by Satan and conquering temptation and sin and not falling. Each of these stories is important to us not only in the history of our faith, but in our daily life. I have a friend who is, she was a high school senior when she first said this in the, high, in the youth group. She said, you can blame anything on your parents until you're about 25 years old. Well, actually, this young lady turns 25 this year, and I have lost track of her. I mean, they need to look her up and see if she still feels the same way. Another story from a young person on the subject of sin and temptation. We have friends whose 10-year-old son once got a note from the teacher saying that he does not take responsibility for his actions. Well, his parents decided this was an opportunity to help him learn and to talk this through. And as they began the conversation, his response was, it's not my fault if I don't take responsibility for my actions. Temptation is attractive. In the Garden of Eden, the tree of knowledge was attractive. It has to be attractive or it wouldn't be temptation. How many pieces of fruit do you think the serpent could have sold to Eve that day? if he had said to her, come and eat this fruit and it'll make you like the devil. No, he said to her, it'll make you like a god. You will be like God. Temptation is related to good things. The satisfaction of hunger or thirst, these are wonderful things. The enjoyment of simple comfort, maybe even wealth, these are good things. The enjoyment of the physical expression of love between two people who love each other. Sex. This is a wonderful and good thing. Good things almost always can somehow be exaggerated. They can be corrupted. They can be distorted, sometimes even to the point of hurting or exploiting other people. And that is temptation to sin. The story in the Garden of Eden, it really has nothing to do whatsoever with fruit. The story in the Garden of Eden is about temptation to be like God. Adam and Eve were tempted 
to be more than God created them to be. They wanted to be more than human beings, and thus they became less than human. We are not beasts. We are not robots. We are not gods. God created us to be human. And real temptation, almost always, is a temptation to be other than God created us to be. And I think the story of temptation in the Garden of Eden is exactly that for us. It is still real for us today. That is what makes that story something other than long ago and far away. It is real for us even today. The temptation to be something other than what God created us to be. The story of Jesus in the wilderness facing temptation from Satan, it's very much the same. Jesus, practically still wet from the baptism, is moved by the Spirit to go into the wilderness, and he is tempted by the devil. Now, I remember when I was a child reading this story and thinking, these temptations really seem kind of silly to me. I mean, I could not imagine ever being tempted to jump off a tall building so that the angels of God would lift me up. That's not a temptation for me. But it was a real temptation for Jesus. It was a temptation for him to do all kinds of magical acts in order to prove to people that he was the Messiah and people would believe. Temptation to turn stones into bread? Nah. On the other hand, if I really were presented with an opportunity to feed the starving people of the world, I'm not sure what kinds of shortcuts and what kinds of moral and ethical principles I would be willing to violate in order to do something that wonderful. That might be a real temptation. The temptation to worship the devil, I've never been tempted to do that. But we also understand that that temptation really is a temptation to take political power. The devil says, Satan says to Jesus, all these kingdoms belong to me, and you can have them if you will simply bow down and worship me. I would think that someone in Jesus' position might have considered it a genuine temptation to take charge, to take control, to take political power. And yet, he did not. The temptations were really about being something other than God created him to be. This is a story about what kind of Messiah, what kind of Savior Jesus will be. And it is his very identity which is at the core of the conversation with Satan. If you are the Son of God, Satan says, then do these things. The temptations basically are to take the shortcut, to take the easier path, maybe the more practical path, maybe even the more effective path in the short run. But in each case, the temptation is really the same. It's the temptation to take a shortcut. It's a temptation to bypass the way of suffering love, to bypass the cross. And we are now back full circle. That temptation to bypass the cross, that temptation to take a shortcut beyond the way of suffering love, that is the temptation to violate Jesus' own true integrity, to deny and betray his nature, to deny and betray who God created him to be. All temptations to be more than human or to be less than human, all temptation to be other than God created us to be, the temptation to violate our own nature, this is where you and I can identify and understand that Adam and Eve's story is in fact our story. That Jesus in the wilderness, his story is our story too. The story of Jesus in the wilderness, 
first of all, we learn from that. In verse 13, a verse that almost no one lifts up. After Jesus has defeated the devil, it says that he departed from him until an opportune time. Sadly, even Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, apparently does not have the privilege of defeating the devil once and for all and never being bothered again. The author, Luke, leaves a hint that the devil just might be back and bother Jesus again someday. And so if you have ever had the experience of working, struggling, crying, and praying to defeat some kind of temptation, finally managed to succeed and felt good about it, only to discover the temptation comes back again someday stronger than ever, take comfort from this. Your experience is much like the experience of Jesus himself. We also learn from this story that his temptations are genuinely real, like our temptations are. And that means that he understands us and we can identify with him. And the great hope that comes from that is this. The one who defeated the devil that day, he is in fact our Savior and our Lord. And that means that we have help. On the most personal level of all, our deepest, darkest, ugliest, most shameful temptation, when we have to deal with that, we have help. We have a resource. And we have power to sustain that resource. That is only a prayer away. We are not alone. We are not alone. Amen. Pastor Bob was telling us of the beginning of Jesus' ministry and some choices that Jesus made as to whom he would follow and how he would serve God and how he would be faithful to what God had called him to do. As we come to the table now, we're actually looking at the opposite end of Jesus' ministry because it was at the Last Supper that Jesus gathered with his disciples and prayed and broke the bread and drank the cup and in that asked them to remember him to remember what was most important to him 
And in the same way, the disciples were to do likewise. And so as we come to this table, whether you have bread and cup before you or it's in your mind, and we're doing it symbolically, much of this is symbolic anyway. But we come to remember that most important thing that we're called to do in a service that we're called to. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this bread and this cup and what they signify. We ask that you bless the bread and the cup that's with each person listening here, whether it's physical bread or something like that that they take and eat and in the cup, or if it's in their mind's eye, we ask that you bless that. And as we take these in remembrance of you, let it be a reminder to us of what you've called us to do, the task that you've called us to do, and the forgiveness of sins that Jesus came to teach us about. These things we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. For it was on the last night, as Jesus was eating with his disciples, that he took a loaf of bread. And after he had blessed it, he broke it. And he said to them, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after they had finished eating, he took the cup. And said to them, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, poured out for you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you show forth my death until I come again. Won't you take, won't you come? The body of Christ broken for you, the cup of blessing poured out for you. the one who defeats sin and temptation on our behalf. May the one who makes it possible for us to live authentically and human, may that one rest with you, be with you, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.